Mackenzie Johnston with Tri-State Livestock News, bringing you discussions concerning fair cattle markets. Today we have the opportunity to chat with Alan Gubert. He's an award-winning ag journalist who was raised on a Southern Illinois dairy farm. What do you think are some of the biggest issues within the cattle industry today? No question in my mind of the bigger issues are you know, with the meat packers gaining you know, almost complete control over the kill spaces. They, then they control backwards, you know, the weight of the cattle, how cattle are fed, how cattle are finished, what price cattle, you know, fed cattle are paid, who's going to feed the cattle because they, you know, they own so many, they control so many under, uh, you know, under contracts, so, you know, what's the grid going to look like, who's running the, the, the board of trade, they have so much market power, unless somebody steps in, and, and when we say got some, somebody, we are, we're talking about the Justice Department, or it even could be Congress. Congress can really step in and start having some serious examinations of these markets. Where the hell have they been? I mean, I have not heard, seen, or watched anybody in Congress talk about this, you know, in an organized manner. Have a hearing. You have a subcommittee on livestock, the House Ag Committee. You know, in that regard, the Democrats could have a hearing. You also have a Senate Ag Committee has a subcommittee on livestock and markets. The Republicans could have a hearing on, on these you know, convulsing, collapsing markets. Why not? What we do instead is, you know, the leaders of this and the leaders of that get together and they all of a sudden we have policy. And nobody's talked about it. hasn't been any hearing. There's been no debate. There's not even been a vote. That guarantees you absolutely one thing, the worst possible policy you could have. And we do that across the board in agriculture anymore. You know, I don't see anybody, an elected official, responding to their constituents' complaints. Mm -hmm. Instead, what they do is they're throwing money at it and saying, well, here, you know, we can't fix it, but here, here's some money, go out and buy some Band-Aids. And what does a rancher or a farmer's reply? Well, thank you very much, because that's all they're going to get. So they take it and they rush to the pharmacy, you know, and, and that's it. And then a year later, two years later, come these things surface again and again and again. And I'll be quite frank with you, one of the things that I see, I'm a Midwestern, I'm not a, you know, an East River, West River, you know, Eastern Slope cowboy. I'm just, I, but I know those markets well enough that, and I've, I've witnessed what has gone on in those markets well enough in the last 30 years to offer this hint. I don't see any cattle group doing a good job at that either, yeah. representing their members. You know, so there's this giant disconnect. I mean, you have three active cattle groups you know, in the American beef industry right now. And I don't see anybody doing anything that's of any value. I see a lot of sniping, a lot of belly aching, a lot of complaining. I see a lot of, you know, bragging. I don't see any movement that would help any one part of their business. And I also see a lot of politics being played in these these operations too. You know, that one side favoring this side, they, they, this group of politicians, you have that's just nonsense, you know. Last time I looked, cattle don't vote. But who the hell cares? I haven't seen a Republican bull or a Democratic cow in my life. Get your act together and, and help everybody. If you want to fix it, take the biblical admonition, you know, and look at yourself first and fix that. And then it's so funny. Everybody in agriculture, I assume, they complain, complain, complain about nothing gets done in Congress. Somebody please tell me what's the last thing the cattle boys did in any of their groups. I mean, go to court, win a court case, so what? I mean, what did it do? You've been doing this for 35 years. I think the record speaks for itself as to your effectiveness. Where are you today? And you want to change things. I would suggest you start changing the leadership. You start changing these organizations. You start, you know, figuring out a better way to really get the, an effective message across and that you are not going to be here in another generation if things don't change. Do you think the current DOJ investigation into our big four beef processors is going to yield results? Never has. I mean, how many swings at the ball does the Justice Department get? I mean, three, three swings and you miss them each time you're out. But apparently not at the Justice Department. Nobody's serious there about this. Anybody hold a hearing? Do you know of anybody at the, the dinner that the Justice Department has assigned this case to? Is there any any investigation out in any part of the country being done by the Justice Department right now? No. Or is it what you suspect has always been? Just talk. Talk, talk, talk. Yeah, well, again, you know, 
35, 30, 35 years of talk hasn't really done much. And until they get really serious about it, and I don't know, you would have thought April and May would have made our political leaders a little bit more aware of the situation back at plants. But instead, you know, what you saw was the Trump administration uh, ably and completely bigfoot did that whole issue, ordered people back to work, and that was it. That's it. And now you got to, now you have to have non governmental groups, you know, like Food and Water Watch or American Civil Liberties Union to file lawsuits to protect the, the, you know, the people who work in these, these, first of all, these dangerous industries and now these enormously dangerous industries. Well, nothing's going to come of that either. And you could complain and whine that outsiders are coming in and changing the industry. They're really not. No one's changed your industry. The only people who have are. The Batista brothers and the Cargill family and the Tyson family. I mean, why do they get a pass? And everybody wants to point to the government as a problem. And now some people are finally discovering the government might be the solution. Well, good luck on that next message and getting that across, getting anything done. I just don't hold that much hope. Not under the current administration. Not under the past administration. Not under the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, the Bush 2 administration. I've, I've seen a lot. And... I've ne- what I've never seen is anything effectively answer these questions. As time goes on, we're seeing the consumer want to know more and more about the foods that they consume. And along with that, they want to know where their food originates from. Do you feel that M-Cool would benefit the cattle industry? It did when you had it. It absolutely did. What I never understood about country of origin labeling were several things. First of all, the big, the big farm groups like American Farm Bureau endorsed it. And they endorsed it in the national convention. And when the big packers got a hold of it and said you did something wrong, they, they arbitrarily removed the leadership. So you had this big farm group, general farm group, saying it was a good thing one, one day, and the next day they, they pulled their support. You have countries that do it all over the world. Mm-hmm. And because we didn't evidently didn't do it right, they were effective in their questioning of the WTO, the World Trade Organizations, and had the WTO essentially tell the United States you couldn't do it. Well, who was the big complainer? Canada. Who does country of origin labeling better than any country we know of? Canada. How do they do it? Well, I've never seen one farm group do that study. I've never seen one cattle group ask how to do it. I mean, the nations all over the world do it. We don't do it because the Packers don't want it done. That's the flat reason, and there's no other reason. And, and since the Packers own half the important people in Congress, you know, the other half run away. I'll say one more thing about Congress relative to these issues like antitrust or or country of origin labeling. I think now we live at a time where I see very, very few, I I almost said none, but I don't want to be that bad, in Congress who actually know these issues at all. At all. And I'm not talking about the antitrust efforts or the Packer concentration numbers. I'm talking about lifespan of cow or, you know, the gestation period of a cow, or how many pounds of beef you can put on a grass, things like that. They don't understand the background. Uh, they have enough working background to make intelligent choices, would be it for a hearing or legislation. And even worse than that, they don't seek it. Mm-hmm. They don't ask anybody. Their staffers don't ask anybody. And they're flying blind. And they and what you see Congress and, and, and our, our representatives do, and even at the local and state level, is handle issues they're familiar with. They don't tackle tougher issues or more broad spectrum issues like country of origin because they don't, they, they, there's no votes there. And so they don't know about it. I would challenge any rancher out there to go to the next town hall meeting of their congressmen or senators and ask them which nations use country of origin labor like on their beef. And the answer would be just slack-jawed nothingness. Because they don't know. And that's a failure of, in part, not just of Congress, it's a failure of fire groups. What are your thoughts on imports of beef and cattle? Who's the biggest advocate of free trade in the world, the United States? Who's the one who's pushed free trade agreements since the mid-'80s? Who's the one who put together you know, the original general agreement on trade and tariffs back in the early-'90s? You know, it was, in fact, it was a Nebraska who was the uh, Secretary of Agriculture back then, Clayton Yeager. We have been a promoter of free trade and low tariffs and free movement of, of goods and services forever in this country. 
So free trade means a two-way street. What I resent about free trade, and people talk about fair trade, I don't even know what fair trade is. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that's just too handy of a campaign slogan that nobody really knows what that means. But what I, what I would like more ranchers and farmers to understand about free trade is they don't grow beef. They don't export, you know, boxes of beef. They grow cattle. That's what they do. They grow grass and they grow cattle. You know, they're not exporters. It's like saying, you know, I'll give you a, a, a Midwestern example. You know, all the farmers wanted to get into ethanol. You know, they saw all the profits of what ADM and Cargill were making in ethanol when ethanol was on the rise. So no sooner than they got national legislation in 2006, the Clean Air Act and stuff like that, to help boost the use of ethanol, farmers started building ethanol plants. And I'm telling you, ADM and Cargill started selling them ethanol plants. And you know why? Because they knew the party was over. And so why do you want to compete? Why did farmers want to compete against ADM and Cargill? Well, that's their business. That's what they do. And farmers should be growing corn and soybeans. That's what you do. Why should you care so much about how these big companies are going to trade? Because you, you, don't, you don't own any shares in those companies. You, you're not on the board of directors of those companies. They're taking advantage of what you do. Why aren't you organizing against them and standing tall and firm instead of your cooperatives selling out to them? You know, there used to be devices in agriculture that made farmers on equal footing with the big corporates that were, that were buying their products, dairy co-ops, grain co-ops. You no know, marketing co-ops, buying co-ops. I don't see or hear much of that at all anymore. They, 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 we've gone our own way, and we've lost a lot of power in the marketplace. So I, I think farmers have a bad understanding of free trade. They have a bad understanding of how the economy works. We're, we've sold enormous amounts of corn and soybeans to China in the last four or five weeks. We've had all these farm groups saying, look at these big sales. Anybody looked at the price of corn and soybeans the last five weeks? It's gone down. I mean, folks, there is no direct link between exports and prices you receive on the farm. There's too big of a lag. There's too many people that need to be paid between you and the end buyer over in China or Japan. You know, there's too many political considerations. I would never, ever, ever depend on exports or, and as such, I would be really questioning of imports. Really, really questioning of imports. And I think Biggest thing beef industry, anybody in the pork industry can do is have country of origin labeling because then the people can be convinced or informed of what beef is out there. If it says this is organic grass fed beef, but it comes from Guatemala, I don't think people will buy that over and above, you know, organically uh, raised grass fed beef, you know, from South Dakota. There is currently a petition circulating for a beef checkoff referendum. Do you have any thoughts on that situation? Oh, again, this is the second act of that, isn't it? Okay. We've done that before. The wording for the act has not changed, if I'm not mistaken, since then. It still permits the secretary to decide whether or not to go ahead with it. He doesn't have to. You can collect all the signatures you want. You know, it's like high schoolers petition and the principal for a longer recess. Good luck. It could show the amount of... of voices out here for change. But need I point out that was done under the Clinton administration the last time and it still didn't get done? An administration that was open to country of origin labeling, open, you know, to antitrust moves, but it still didn't permit a vote on the checkoff. So what's changed this time? People just screaming louder? Is that is that the change? Oh, how does that work at your house? I see these efforts being a, a, a tool being used by certain groups to organize the group better. Are they organizing for cattlemen? I don't think so. We have seen consumers being gouged at the meat counters in their grocery stores over the past few months since COVID-19 hit, and we have yet to see those prices come down at the retail level. Do you think we have done permanent damage to beef demand? Well, you have in my house. You know, when I see ribeyes at $20 a ribeye, folks, I consider myself not just informed, but, you know, I have the money. I could, I could spend that for a steak, but I'm not going to. Why would I? So, no, and, and what, to answer your question, what's going to make it come down? I have no idea why, you know, what's going to make it come down. I know why it went up. Yeah. And if you're, if you're making six and seven hundred dollars a head, you know, killing cattle, you know, you're happy 
and cattlemen seem to be, it's fallen to only $250. Had they seem to be happy with that, are you nuts? You're still giving away $200 or more? You need to reevaluate the whole project that you're, you're involved in if you think that's okay. Well, Packers have to make money. Folks, they've always made money. You know how you can tell? They're still there, and they're still buying up small Packers. Here's what I'd like to do overall. Here's what I'd like to see in all of agriculture, corn, soybeans, cattle, hogs, you name it. I would like to see for every dollar we spend on farm programs, 20 cents of that dollar be ticketed to smaller local operations. I don't care what they grow. They could grow zucchinis. They could grow, you know, green five-legged cattle. I don't care. But let's quit giving all the money to the same people, taking it in the direction that 90% of the people don't want to go. Can we do that? So just, and I don't want 50%. I don't want 50 cents out of a dollar. I'm not greedy. Give me 20. And I'll still, that 20% will still change rural America. Because you, just, you start building local packing plants, I can't Kill 50 cattle a day. Just 50 cattle a day. You know, at the end of the day, at the end of the week, they've killed 250 cattle. At the end of the year, they killed 10,000 cattle. Holy cow. You think that won't make a difference in your local community? And you give them... Every state that I know has state meat inspectors are federally trained. They know the federal laws. You think the states write their own meat inspection laws? No, they're all, they photocopy the federal inspection law. So virtually every state inspector is a federal meat inspector. You know, look it up. That's just the way it is. So that would be a fast, easy change. They have these local, you know, meat packers, these local uh, slaughterers sell meat across both you know, any state line they wanted to. And those, those are simple things. But here's what I would do with the 20 cents to make that happen. Instead of your local community or your local county giving the big packer 10 years of free water, you know, a thousand acres to build a new plant on, building all the damn roads to it, do that for a small packer, would you please? Just a small, and that might cost $1 million instead of $50 million giveaway. One thing that Tyson's has a lot of is money. They should have to spend it for their own plant. And they shouldn't get favoritism when it comes to, you know, worker rights or worker rules or OSHA requirements and stuff like that. Just level the field. And I'm not even asking it for a B-level. Give me one fifth. Give me one step up for every four you get, and I'll still beat you. Because they can't do it like you and I can. They can't do it locally. And I'll have the whole local community buying the, the local beef. It's the best you ever had. I can talk, walk into two or three different little stores that shouldn't be even in existence here in Illinois. You can walk in them, and they look like they're something out of the 1950s. And I would know. I was a kid in the late 1950s. And you walk back to the back of the room, there's a meat counter. And the meat counter, I'm not kidding you, it's not 25 feet wide. It takes up the whole back of the store, five people work in it. When people get can buy local meat, these butchers go through unbelievable amounts of food mm-hmm. each and every day. Because people want quality, and they will pay for quality. And if you can deliver that locally, fresh cut, right to their hands, and they know your name, well, that's a home run every time. Every time. Right. And I miss that. I really do miss that. Mm-hmm. I go back to my home in South, deep in southern Illinois. I go right to the guy at Miller's Meat Market, and I buy all the pork sausages that will fit in the <laughs> I do. I don't buy pork sausage anywhere else. And, and that's, I'm 400 miles from there. So I love it. I mean, people will do that. Just give them a chance. And, and I'm not talking about taking the ladder away from the big farmers, the big feedlots. They can have their own ladder. Give me one, too. That's all I want. And if government's going to be the kingmaker, let's make sure they, they pick a prince every now and then, just not the kings.